Hunter Hooker. Okay, so we're gonna um, uh, move on to the Dr. Dinosaur Bill, uh, which is um, a house bill as well. And what's the number on it, please? It's 430. 430, okay. So we have uh, the reporter of the bill and we also have um, uh, Jen Carby who probably was a drafter of the bill. It was, yes. Okay, so um, we know that this is to expand Dr. Dinosaur coverage. So um, Senator Hooker, shall we start with you please? Okay, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come in and talk about this important bill that would um, allow coverage for children and for pregnant women who um, are not, um, who have a status that does not allow them to be covered under Medicaid. So the bill is a new, really a new program. The program would be a new program. It would be Dr. Dinosaur-like in that it would provide the similar coverage, although it would be paid for by the state. So I'm gonna let Jennifer um, Carby speak to what the specifics of the bill are and be happy to listen in and try to answer any questions. And we don't, um, I don't know if it's a lengthy bill or not. It's five pages. It's a five page bill. Okay. Um, do you want me to put it up? Uh, yes, and we'll whip through it pretty quickly because I, okay. I think what we're doing is, uh, what we're saying is we want to provide health care coverage to uh, children whose um, uh, uh, status, um, immigration status, uh, does not bring them in under the traditional Medicaid um, eligible uh, coverage that would come from Dr. Dinosaur. So it's really uh, Dr. Don uh, apparel, it's Dr. Dinosaur, it's just that rather than being able to get the Medicaid match, we are having to provide the coverage um, with state dollars only. That's right. And it was important to Diva that we not try to connect it. And the reason it uses things like Dr. Dinosaur like um, is because they, um, the, the proposal is for them to do a more streamlined um, intake process, determination process, rather than having to do the full Medicaid eligibility determination, find somebody ineligible as a result of their immigration status, and then um, allow them to have this benefit. So it would be, a, it'd be they'd be evaluating people, um, determining eligibility for this specific program. So we start out with some intent, basically saying in establishing this program, it's the intent of the General Assembly that the benefits and eligibility criteria should align to the greatest extent practicable with those in the Dr. Dinosaur program. Um, and then it provides this, this coverage. Um, it does say the term Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available includes migrant workers who are employed in seasonal occupations in the state. Um, so it's not just people who are here year round, but also people who may be here uh, seasonally to perform, um, perform mm -hmm. work duties. So it directs the agency to provide hospital, medical, dental, and prescription drug coverage equivalent to that in the Medicaid state plan to the following categories of Vermont residents who have this immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available and who are otherwise uninsured. So children under 19 whose household income doesn't exceed that for eligibility under the Vermont state plan, Medicaid state plan and pregnant individuals whose income does not include the income threshold under the Medicaid state plan for coverage during their pregnancy and for postpartum coverage equivalent to that under the Medicaid state plan. That's language because it's currently 60 days postpartum, but there's an, op an option for states under ARPA to extend that to 12 months. So if the state were to elect that in Dr. Dinosaur, it would, the same provision would apply in this uh, program. Specifies that the confidentiality provisions set forth in under the Medicaid program, that's section 1902A, shall apply to all applications submitted and records created under, the, under this section, except AHS shall not make any information about applicants or enrollees available to the US government. So it's a state only program and to alleviate concerns about immigration information going to the federal government that says they don't share that information. It allows AHS to adopt rules to carry out the purposes 
Then we have a one-time appropriation for sort of this transition year as the program, the program wouldn't actually be available until um, next year, assuming appropriations are made for it. So this has the sum of 1.4 million in one-time funds appropriated to AHS in FY22 be used for grants or reimbursements or both to healthcare providers for delivering services during FY22 to this population. So until they are eligible for the actual coverage under the program, there'd be money to providers to deliver the services to them. Then also grants to Vermont organizations that work with members of Vermont's undocumented immigrant community or the healthcare community to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach and information regarding opportunities for these children and pregnant individuals um, to, to access healthcare services at low or no cost, both during this year and also later on during uh, under the program. The outreach and information would include information on that confidentiality of records. Um, and the third use of the funding is implementing the technological and operational processes necessary for DIVA to administer the program beginning on July 1st of next year. Section three, has the Agency of Human Services providing information on the estimated FY23 costs of providing this Dr. Dinosaur-like coverage beginning on July 1st, 2022, as part of the, the, the agency's FY23 budget presentation to this committee and to the policy committees. And then the section two, that 1.4 million in one-time money would take effect on July 1st. Everything else would take effect on passage with AHS making that coverage available under the Dr. Dinosaur-like program beginning July 1st, 2022, subject to FY23 appropriations for that purpose. So it's- Are they again, ready to implement July 1st? They are ready. So this would be July 1st, 2022. They said they, they need you know nine months or so oh, to get okay. it up and running. So that's why there's that transitional provision. Otherwise, no, they were not prepared July 1st of this year. Okay. So can I, and can then I change right. title. Yes, go ahead, uh, Senator Brewer. Um, I, can't, I can't move around in the do document, so yes. Where it's, you want? it's hard to, um, to pull it together. But so this is doing a one-time money infusion to get the pro program going. And then is it is it committing the state to go forward or are they coming back with data to the appropriations committee a year out to um, to get that ongoing commitment going? More the latter. It's so section two is the one time appropriation is sort of a transitional year. It's not really trying to run the program yet. Um, it's do, it's laying the groundwork, but also giving money to providers to deliver the care now while things are getting set up. Um, but a lot of it is this technological and operational processes that DIVA needs to do in this year so that, uh, it, so that they would be ready beginning July 1st, 2022. But then it has the coverage taking effect or beginning on July 1st, 2022, but subject to the FY23 appropriations. So they're coming back to you next year to say what they think it would cost, which I think, and I think Nolan is here um, and can tell you about the um, about the cost. But that at, there at that is an point, estimate already. We would have already laid technological groundwork, and we would have um, and committed and, you know, to it at that point, pretty much. You would have um, taken steps to implement it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, my question, I guess, gets into um, this is a base ongoing expenditure starting in 23? Yes, subject to obviously to the appropriations for that, but yes. It, does Nolan have a fiscal note with him? I believe he does. I will take this yes. down and let Nolan speak to you. Uh, for the record, Nolan and I will the joint fiscal office. I do have a fiscal note. Um, it's a little rough, um, but I can send it. It's very similar to what was passed in the house. Uh, I can also pull it up if you want. Uh, Post it. Yeah, I, uh, I'll send it out um, in a minute. But basically, what it says is that the estimated on this is based on. So, in short, um, I worked with Diva 
to come up with an estimate and they work with the advocates and they estimate that there's about 22 undocumented pre pregnant women um, and that cost would estimate about a million dollars. Then there's about a hundred children, but they'd be at varying per member per month, depending on what Medicaid eligibility, uh, Medicaid eligibility group they'd be in. But the estimate's about 261,000. So it's a total of estimated of, to be about $1.3 million. Um, and that's uh, gross, no state dollars. That's what we think it will cost ongoing potentially. Yeah. So uh, if we pass this then um, and get it set up, um, the house um, right now, it's one time for the startup um, and design and some payment to providers. Right. But in the interim payment, but it is really representing an ongoing um, expenditure. And so that's something that will have to be accommodated in um, the budget next year. And just to just to be clear on the house side where the 1.4 was was accounted for, it was pretty much accounted for as a base expenditure. Well, that's what I was struggling with, yeah. um, Stephanie, because my impression from talking with you is that they had recognized that you're setting up something yes, with a commitment did. to continue it. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, and why is the first year the same amount as when we get it set up and running? Um, probably because you've got a, um, a lag time between when uh, payments are actually being met. So um, the second year would be all provider payments. And the first year, it would be a combination of startup administrative costs, programming, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, and then some um, coverage payments. I think that house, when they did it, part of it was they wanted to start getting money out the door to start helping people immediately while the program was being created by them. Well, this should help um, uh, reduce uncompensated care. Right. Wonder if we're gonna see a concurrent reduction on premiums. Yeah, I we mean, talked about giving, uh, getting Mullen in, didn't we, and asking him about that? Not this. No. I, I don't think so, because we just got the bill. Can I ask uh, another question? And I yes, guess you may. Go to Jen. Um, so a, a long time ago, Bobby and I worked on driver's licenses for undocumented migrant workers. And there was a commitment from Department of Motor Vehicles not to share the information. And then over a course of four or five years, it became clear that they were sharing information. Oh, let me tell you, let me tell you the agency, uh, the confidentiality uh, okay. climate and, and requirements is very, very different than DMV that even sells data. Okay, that was my question is, mm -hmm. can we take that to the bank when mm -hmm. it says that they shall not share? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, a, this is a stronger statement than we had in that bill. Uh -huh. I just um, wanted to ask the question. Yeah, um, I, I would have to say that all these benefit programs are the confidentiality is um, uh, very strenuous. It's very um, stringent, and um, uh, people are uh, don't release information. Um, um, whether we're talking about uh, food stamp eligibility to Medicaid eligibility to um, any of the other benefit programs, there there's um, there, it, it's a very different uh, situation. So if we say it's confidential, I would say that um, based on 50 years of experience, it is confidential. Okay, thank you. See, I'm, the only thing I'm wondering is <clears throat> we have, seems like we have ample one-time money. I just am wondering about a year from now, I hope that we have- yeah, That's what I- uh, that's why Stephanie's comment is so important because the house, when it passed it, anticipated this as an ongoing expenditure and accommodated in their base. So even so though this did. is one time to get it set up and to make these interim payments, this is assumed um, as an ongoing uh, um, and they have ongoing revenue to support it. Yeah, okay. Okay, 
So no, I'm going to suggest that we remove this appropriation and we put it in the budget. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is obvious. And that is a lot of what we're doing here represents general fund commitment. And that general fund is generated through some of the um, other parts of the budget that, um, that uh, free up general fund through the use of ARPA. And so um, this money is available as long as that construct and the budget is signed and becomes law. So this needs to come and be part of the budget. And I would- um, So are uh, you, um, I'm, what I'm wondering, are you suggesting taking out all of section two or just making section two grants dependent on funding being um, provided elsewhere? I want to make it, I want it a contingent on appropriations and grants mm -hmm. being provided. So it'd be just basically the first line of section two coming out and to the extent that funding is provided in, in fiscal yes. year 2022, yes. yeah. then the grants mm -hmm. happen. Okay. Yeah, thank but you. It, it's with the understanding that we are going to put it in the big bill. That's my yeah. only point. Is yeah. um, even and though we'll, we'll put it in the, the big bill is a very straightforward yeah. piece of money that says for grants uh, for and yes. we won't. This bill won't be law yet, but we'll reference the programs being set up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that something you can, Jen, you're shaking your head. That's something you'll take care of. Yes, and thank you, Stephanie. That's helpful to know what it should say, and I will. Um, yes, I can do that. Okay, so um, once we make that change, so it makes it clear that you know this um, will um, move forward, and it's uh, a contingent on the appropriation that, and the appropriation we're going to put into the budget. Yep. All right. So, um, shall unless there are further questions, um, shall we have our clerk um, call the roll? Yes. You're, you're you muted, Mr. Clerk. Hmm. Quiet as he's been in a while. I know. Oh, okay. There, you're back. <laughs> Senator Ballant. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Nitka. Yes. Senator Sears. Senator yes. Shaw. Oh, Senator. I Shaw. was unstable at the moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, for me. Senator Westman. Yes. Senator Kitchell. Yes. Okay, we are unanimous. I guess I'm the reporter because I have diva. Okay. Unlike the House, Jen, we all have to. <laughs> we all have our budget assignments. So, all right. Um, once you. we get that language, uh, I will then. Um, send that in the vote and the reporter to um, the secretary's office. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee. Okay. Um, so uh, do we have S120? Is that, are you the reporter on that as well, Senator Hooker? I am. Okay. Um, Shall we take up S120? Pretty sure we don't have possession of that one yet, but we Oh, oh know, we don't. It's well, you know, do a technicality, but you know. Right. It actually, they decided this morning to make it a committee bill, and so it has not yet been introduced. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh then I can't. Uh, we can still look right. at it if you want. You can talk through it. it. It just, your action today will have to probably be you know. I think, I think, right. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> um, so now we don't have S120. We have a committee bill. You do. Right. Okay. It's the combination of S120 and S132. And what are those? Okay. Well, we're about to hear from the reporter. Okay. All right. So, um, this bill proposes to establish a task force on affordable, accessible health care to explore opportunities to make health care more affordable for Vermont residents and employers. It would require an account. That's the that was the primary purpose of S120. And then 
from S-132. Uh, it would require accountable care organizations to collect and analyze clinical data regarding health care quality and provide the results of its analysis to the Green Mountain Care Board. It would prohibit pharmacy benefit managers from engaging in certain activities with respect to entities participating in the 340B drug pricing program. The bill would make the Commissioner of Health responsible for the state improvement, health improvement plan and require the Commissioner to provide information to the General Assembly about the plan. And it would require reports to the General Assembly on increases in health insurance, insurers' administrative costs, on accountable care organizations, care coordination initiatives, and on the likely impact of requiring health insurance plans to allow at least two primary care visits per year without cost sharing. The bill would also direct the Department of Financial Regulation to review Vermont's benchmark plans establishing the state's essential health insurance. Uh, we, we've just done that in the budget. Ah, well. Yes, they weren't sure if you were putting it in, so they put it in. Uh, I, let the, I let the chair know that we were um, putting it in the budget. That was in her seven-page memo um, requested. Okay, so would that be something you would want us to take out? Um, what you, happens? I don't know. You need to decide what vehicle you want to use. Well, we uh, were putting it in at the request of the uh, committee, uh, the chair. I um, think it wasn't clear to us this morning whether or not it had been included, and that's why it was included here as sort of. Wouldn't, wouldn't you rather have it ride in the budget? No. No? <laughs> I would. <laughs> yeah. I would Bobby. defer to Jen. The, um, and the bill has not been introduced yet, so we could we, we can circle it. back to the committee and take it out. Okay. okay. All right. It, that would be easier. We've, okay. uh, we have yeah. been in touch with uh, Commissioner Pichak. He has indicated his support for the language. He's reviewed it. Um, and so we had already made a decision that we would um, uh, uh, include the requested language in the budget. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. You're lucky, Cheryl. I got out of that one easily. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and if you want um, Jennifer to go through the bill, well, we're we're getting it because there's an appropriation. Right. I think probably that's what we need to focus on. Okay. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, great. So I will put this up and direct you to the appropriation. Uh, and the appropriation is for this task force uh -huh. that Senator Hooker mentioned. Um, so it creates, starts out with findings. It creates this task force on affordable, accessible health care. Uh, it has three members of the House, three members of the Senate. The task force's duty is to explore opportunities to make health care more affordable for Vermont residents and employers, including identifying potential opportunities to leverage federal, federal flexibility and financing and to expand existing public health care programs. So uh, would then, this a task force then feed into our waiver negotiate? I'm just thinking about, because um, okay. we have language that the Health, commit, uh, Health and Welfare Committee already has about directing CMS in our waiver negotiations to... Um, uh, right, to, to uh, try to keep or to expand increase, the flexibility. Yeah, it, the language is to increase the state's flexibility to use global commitment investment dollars to increase access to care, coverage, improve health outcomes, strengthen healthcare delivery, promote transformation to value-based and integrated models of care. Right. That language is actually the language you just cited there is actually from the way our current global commitment waiver. So it's really looking to main to maintain or expand okay. our flexibility and global commitment investments. Generally, it, it could affect this uh, as far as, you know, we may identify the, the task force may identify uh, things that we could use global commitment investment dollars for okay. if we were afforded the same or greater flexibility. Okay. All right. Um, and, all right. But the, the timing is not really intended to feed in. The report okay. from this group right. comes back in January. 
I see. Okay. All right. right. Yeah. Our, our intent, I think, Madam Chair, was to make sure that we heard from Vermonters and what um, their concerns are about the health care system. And I would hope that it would feed into the negotiations. Uh, have we not done this before through, through the past couple of years? Seems like as this- As far as the task force, this kind of task force? The kind of information that's gonna be worked on here. It seems like a lot of groups have worked on this previously. Um, well, I maybe we could, um, Becca, do you wanna to speak to this? We felt like, um, Senator, that there was a particular opportunity here that we haven't had in years because of the new administration in, in DC, that there were opportunities for, for expanding uh, care under existing, you know, federal programs. So that was the that was the impetus. What is the opportunity we have now under this current administration that we haven't had previously? And you're right, Senator Nika. That I mean, there there is a provision in here about looking at what previous studies and analyses on affordability have done. So building on things that have been done in the past, but looking at this moment in time and what might be possible, um, and also focus on some other things like healthcare disparities the particular impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the uninsured rate, hmm. like that. So as far as the funding itself, um, there would be a consultant, uh, hmm. where is it? Um, there'd be consultant is envisioned to coordinate the work of this task force and the bill appropriates 175,000 to the Office of Legislative Operations in FY22 for this consultant and to cover related costs of actuarial analyses, research meetings, and the per diems and reimbursement of expenses for the members, who again are all legislators. Seems like we've got a couple of things here. Usually coordinating activities could be as a basic as scheduling public meetings. I remember years ago, when we had the Poverty Council, we went around and met. Um, we did it certainly with the child welfare after um, the child's death in Rutland, Senator Sears. Um, it seems like um, uh, to coordinate the activities of, of the task force, you're really talking about higher level activities, I would assume, because you're not gonna have, you, you're gonna have, uh, I would think Office of Legislative Operations do um, some of the, you know, the, um, uh, the right. scheduling yep. and, right. you know, they're in here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, um, so I was just wondering, uh, to coordinate the task force work. I, I'm just, uh, it's, it's more than, it's more than coordination. And that's all I'm saying. There's a report. I think that the coordinator would help to gather to put together i mean that's part of the part of the plan. no i i was just thinking I, that if you're hiring a consultant you really are hiring them to do higher level work than organizing meetings that kind of uh coordination of of uh yeah. um activities but yes we were real cheap back then we just went around the state and held meetings and used like right. council mm -hmm. i mean i i just think it's just like whoa whoa the council oh, doesn't do work like this? No, no, no. What is the um, the funding source? Um, General that's funds. for us to decide, I guess. Right. Okay. Hmm. Uh, where's right. that hearing aid bill? Sorry? The, the hearing, hearing aid. <laughs> what? <laughs> They did not include, so they they uh, put that in. Although now it's going in your uh, in the budget to to be looked at in the context of the benchmark plan analysis um, because of the cost to the state of of enacting a new mandate. Um, yeah, it's along the indentures and all the other things. Under the Affordable Care Act, the state would have to pick up the cost. Um, defray it's called state deferral the state would have to defray the cost of any new mandate enacted after 2011. yeah that's what most of my constituents have been upset about is we're the only state in new england doesn't provide hearing aid coverage for medicaid and, uh, well it's going to be looked insurance, at insurance so yeah 
Yeah. For hundred and how much? How many thousands of dollars to look at? Well, they've got federal funds to look at to do a, a benchmark plan review and uh, market analysis more generally. So that's part of it. And that's what DFR is doing. That's what DFR is doing, right? Okay. In consultation with their partner agencies in the state government. Thank right. you very much. Appreciate it. All right. So shall we keep going? Data collection and analysis. Well, that's separate. That's the ACO. I'm happy oh, yeah. to take you through okay. the rest of it, no. but none yeah. of the rest of it has a cost. Okay. All right. So the 175 is for the legislature um, to um, engage in a contractor or a consultant um, to do I, I don't, the, to coordinate the activities of the task force is just it, it just seems like that's an understatement of what we uh, what we want of this high level position. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a lot of money for a few months worth of work. Well, not if you're having the person um, do uh, actuarial analyses, research. Um, Research is, is there research meetings or research comma meetings? I think so. I think that was the language that was provided <laughs> to me. I can certainly. Well, what's a research meeting? <clears throat> uh, maybe as we look opposed at, to. Should there be a comma? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I would I'm think looking. it's analyses to cover uh, cost of analyses, research comma meetings. Re not, it seems like you need a comma there between research and meetings. So that they do research. Certainly they sort of put that in there. Is this a contract to sort of facilitate meetings as well? Or I, I don't know. The information, the language that was provided to me was actuarial analysis, comma, research meetings, and travel. That's I would think to meant. cover the cost of research, I would think. Yeah. Yes. Wait, where's where's travel? Uh, well, I didn't put that. I think we decided that was included in that's going to cover the compensation the and reimbursement. and reimbursement, right? And it does state that they can the meetings can be remote. Yes. So I, I, I think you need a comma because I think what you're doing is paying this person to not only do analyses but research, and right. then and to set um, up meetings. Got a comma? No, yeah. Yeah. How so it sounds like if there were any costs associated with renting a space or something like that. You know, maybe it's um, um, maybe it's better to support the activities of the task force um, uh, by um, um, by providing uh, actuality analysis. Court. I, I'm just a little worried about coordination. Seems to be not at the higher level analytical yeah. uh, level that I think you want here for a consultant of this nature. So I, you know, I think you are retaining the services of a, a consultant um, to provide the task force with, um, with uh, actual Actuarial analysis, health. research, um, and then split out meetings and per diems from something else because it just, um, it seems like it's not stating the level of, of um, expertise that you would we would want 175,000 to um, pay. Um, Becca, I know this is something that you yes. um, have felt very strongly about. So maybe you could help us um, make sure that this money and the position here is at the level you had in mind. Exactly. And I think you're, you're, you're moving in the direction I was just thinking, Senator Kitchell, that it's really not to coordinate the activities. It's really about supporting the the, the research and the, the data that this task force needs to be uh, gathering uh, and understanding the information. So um, to what extent, uh, thinking about our, our timeline, uh, do we want to try to wordsmith this now or should I huddle up with uh, Jen Carby and the chair? Even that you don't have, I mean, that this bill is still the Senate Health and Welfare Committee bill. It may make right. sense to, for you to, and I may, well, I can leave the comment in there, but it, but it, um, it may make yeah. sense for this committee to propose an amendment when you get the bill. What? I assume it will be referred yes. here after, I guess, after it goes to rules. Okay, it was voted out of committee. 
it, it was, I would say, softly voted out of committee. We're going to have to go back because um, we just took out that benchmark and the DFR benchmark analysis. Okay. Sort of conditionally the, uh, the, voted. But Chad, uh, also, other, um, I was going to say, well, this, is a, this is appropriation language, so you could always, if you're going to pull it out and put it in the budget, you can fix well, it. Well, that's exactly what I'm about to say, Nolan, is that, you know, we have been saying we deal with this so we could... Um, have some general language about the appropriation, you know what I mean, uh, subject to appropriation. Sure. And, Would you still name the dollar amount? Or do you, in the, when you say subject to appropriation? No, we don't have to, but we would obviously um, have to do it in the budget. Right. But to the extent funds are appropriated, the Office of Legislative Operations yeah. shall, you know, okay. you know uh, engage well, a consultant conduct meetings, whatever the language you guys okay. come up with. So are. what I would say, oh, okay. So we're going to have to, when we get the, because it's been voted out of committee, then the committee can't make the change to to do this. We're going to have to amend the, the committee. Well, bill. They, they haven't, I, I mean, I look for Senator Hooker, but I don't think it's actually been provided because I only just put it into um this format, they'd still been looking at it in the S120 format this morning. So I think if it needed to, to be revisited, there, there was awareness in the committee this morning that it might need to be revisited. Um, so I think it's up to you where you want to do that. It seems like they should put in some more meat in terms of what the consultant will do for that price. Down, so you can talk. We can, we can, um, we can, um, we can do an amendment that um, will take care of the language relative to you know uh, funds as appropriated, and then deal with it in the big bill. But the rewrite of what you want this person to do seems like that should um, should be done by the policy committee, um, not not the appropriations mm -hmm. committee. I mean, I can right. you know obviously I've been thinking about how to rewrite it, but. Um, uh, or, you know, Becca, do you have a, do you want us to, if we're doing an amendment to deal with it, maybe, um, maybe by Monday, yep. uh, when we finish up the bill, we'll put the money into the budget and, uh, we could move our amendment, um, and then, and it would include a rewrite of what this, uh, consultant would do. I think okay. you're putting a comma in is a step forward because I think the intent was for that person to gather information. There are only going to be up to eight meetings of this task force. I don't see how we can read all of the reports and stuff and gather the information that's necessary without outside help. So that, I think you're correct, Senator Kitchell. In, yeah, it's research. Have, um, so you had a comment, Bobby? Well, I was wondering on line nine of the the language that we had up there, it says something about payments shall be made from, from the appropriation to the General Assembly. Is that, uh, should that be from the General Assembly? So let me just put this back up. So, uh, this on is the line compensation. Nine, the payment well, the general be, fund. The payment oh. shall be made from monies appropriated. Yeah. We're, having to, to we're having to take it out of the legislative budget. Right. Oh, oh, oh. Really? It's kind of uh -huh. No, but we're going to. Although but, it also then addresses per diem and reimbursement down here. So I don't. It's a little cyclical now that I'm looking it, well, at Well, I think what we're saying for the members for the members of the task force they get paid their per diem like we normally do the appropriation is for that um uh, to procure those cons consultative services right but there's still the per diem compensation and reimbursement down here within um, that that could probably come out if it's up yeah there. i think so because normally when we do that um uh, and we also make it clear um, for not more than eight meetings, but we all, uh, is this all just members of the General Assembly, the yep. task force? Okay, okay. Yeah, three and then I don't think that. we need to do that. Um, 
uh, get rid of that and the per diem compensation yes. in the I. I agree. But we're going to rewrite that anyway. Right. All right. So, um, committee, we could move the bill. Um, I'm amending by deleting that section, but we don't have a replacement language yet. But okay, you don't um, have the bill isn't a bill yet. Oh, well, that's true. So it's that'll give media. us some time and we would put the money into the budget and then we would put in some language around as as Stephanie just said, you know, as um, as appropriated and we can rewrite what we want the person to do. So we've got a little bit of time on that. OK. All right. So the main thing is uh, the 175 and that's got to be one time what general fund. It takes it out of the general fund. I don't. Yeah, that's that would be the, the that's the source you would use for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, well, we've got time to do that between. Uh, the important thing is to uh, um, have that money um, for have the budget reflect that money, include that money, and then we've got time to do um, our amendment that would uh, be a rewrite that would not specify the amount of per, it wouldn't. Um, reference a specific uh, amount of money and it would just reference as appropriated and we will um, rework the uh, language relative to what the consultant does. Good. And we've got time to do that. Um, um, and we could just do it as an appropriations amendment so it doesn't have to go back to the committee. We'll just do both. Um, and so um, my question is who wants to help write the replacement language on what the consultant does? Shouldn't, shouldn't the committee have a part in that? Yeah, the committee should write that. I mean, we don't know what when it is they want done. Well, I think I think we know we want to have it. It's very clear that it's a very high level. Um, How about we cut it back? I don't <laughs> think we super high level. Why should it be so high? Um, well, I think it could be up to. It doesn't have to be that amount. I mean, it doesn't have to come in exactly at that amount. So I'm going to um, say up to. Um, no, we, we, we usually do an appropriation, but it doesn't oftentimes um, something comes in less than appropriated. I'm going to suggest that we, um, um, I'll work with Senator Ballant and, um, and see if we can do some kind of, uh, and then we'll share it with the uh, policy committee to make sure it's all right. But I think that we can come up with something and Jen, maybe you can help us think about how to frame that um, so it's clear that we are talking about um, a person who is doing the research, doing the uh, actuarial analysis, and um, and a very high level uh, amount of um, of uh, um, recommendations or whatever distillation to uh, formulate rec recommendations. Okay. Um, and I think what the desire is obviously to inform. Um, legislative health policy decisions. So I'm um, committee, rather than our spending more time on a Friday afternoon here, um, we're agreeing we'll move the bill um, favorably um, and we, will, we won't act on it today um, until we get the amendment, but hopefully by Monday or Tuesday, we will have it. Uh, but as long as the money's in the budget that we pass, we're all set. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that does it for bills. Um, Senator Westman, do you have, um, I know that Stephanie came in to natural resources this morning and do you want to clarify um, the funding on clean water based on the work that, that uh, your morning committee did? Or are you ready to do that? 
You're muted. You're muted, Rich. I thought when we um, when the chair came in to present, um, what well, was it, 109, that um, he basically laid out the parameters of what um, um, on the weatherization piece. And um, we have um, um, the, no, I think- I was, I, I'm not talking about weather. I'm talking about the, uh, the clean water and the split and uh, the testimony this morning. That, we uh, didn't. We on. didn't make any decisions this morning about um, water. Uh, Did the secretary recommend a split between the Clean Water Fund and the DEC for the hundred million dollars at all? She um, um, made a statement about what um, they would um, choose to do, but the committee didn't take any position. So and we're, we, it'll be up to us then to split it. All right. Well, Stephanie and I'll talk about it and see what we recommend to the committee. Um, all right. She, so bas she, um, she basically said that um, um, the act that's in place, was it um, Act 64, that we should just appropriate the money based upon that and let them um, um, spend it based upon... Um, that framework that is set in place, um, but the committee didn't discuss that at all. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know, Stephanie, I know that um, certain joint fiscal has had some uh, discussions with, um, uh, with Secretary Moore about what will work. Maybe we can just um, take um, yep. that and see how it fits. Yep. Okay. And we have we have the the sort of breakdown of the first year from the governor's plan, which is I think in the forty million dollar range, and that would probably fit. Um, I, and then the remainder would go in the clean water fund. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I and she recommended it not go in the clean water fund. Well, we have I, we have we're going to some of it should flow through the clean water fund, but not. She, I, I thought I, her was I, not hundred percent. I'm I'm not saying, uh, I'm just telling you what she said. Okay. All right, well, maybe we can get some clarification on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, we had some other language, uh, the study language for the fees and um, the uh, surcharges. surcharges study um, to make it more um, expansive because of the testimony that we received from the court uh, and the impact the declining revenues from fees or surcharges are having. Um, so Senator Sears, you're there, I think. Maybe he's not, maybe. We need him because this is his section. Do we have other um, language that we can uh, go through or have I, I've gone through the ones that I was working on. Oh, Senator Sears, um, glad to have you back. We wanted to just uh, close out the language uh, on the study committee to look at surcharges and the programs that are funded. Have you had yeah, a chance? The, well, the, um, the uh, VSDA would like to be at the table. On surcharges? Yeah, because all the victims advocates are state employees. What's that got to do with relying on revenue? Well, let's look at the let's look at our language. Okay. And Thank see you. what and see what where they would. <coughs> this is kind of unusual to have uh, state employees on fees, isn't it? And tax Usually. revenue. Yep. So, uh, Chrissy, if you make me co-host. Um, I can I can throw up the, the draft that I sent to Senator Sears and Senator. If it didn't happen, you know. <laughs> well, um, it, it seems like. Well, let's look at this study. If, if it's, I, I, the what, purpose of the committee is to address anticipated decreases in revenues and to develop a plan to ensure these programs are able to provide services. I, I, um, I would think that um, I, I would think that it would suggest that VSEA should participate because tax revenues are 
um, you know, support programs that are conducted by state employees. All well, right, let's keep going. I'm just, I'm just giving you the request. Where did this come from? This is, this from, is, yeah, go ahead. It came from the Center for the Center for Crime Victim Services, but I've also heard from the judiciary um, and various other groups that rely on fines, surcharges, and fees to um, fund their programs. And when those those fines, as you know, and it's also the towns, quite frankly, that are also losing fine money because we're not. You know, there aren't as many, especially during COVID, not as many tickets given out. Um, so they lose on the fine money. But yeah, but that they haven't been doing anything either. I mean, they keep talking no. about oh, this. This is a national, you know, there's I sent it at Center Sears. It's it uh, that, um, uh, what is it, Route 50, which is yep. really, I think, done by NCSL, is talking about, I thought it was very timely because yep. they were referencing this very same problem and that it is it is regressive and that um, that it's as a source of revenue for program um, uh, funding is a, a national problem. So this is really not unique to Vermont. Well, and I agree. We ha we had testimony that there were people who had been, um, you know, uh, disadvantaged by this because they couldn't pay their fees and the the surcharges. But then we have competing testimony from organizations that will see their money dry up, and so you in effect have organizations lobbying against the indigent um, <laughs> because they want the money to come in. Um, which is, it's a weird position to be. Yeah, it is. All right, well, well let's keep this going. this is all over, once well, we, this is we, all over, shouldn't the revenues come back? No, no they've been not, declining right they've along. They've been declining for years. And part of the problem is rather than rely on general fund to start programs, it was simpler to say, all right, we'll take a certain amount of fine money. Uh, we'll put on a surcharge. We'll do this, we'll do that. And as a result, these I know I paid plenty of that. Are not getting, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating either. Um, let's keep going so here. The composition of the committee. Um, we have two threes here. The one I added in this redraft was the the one member from the judicial branch appointed by the chief justice. Um, I, am I hearing that you want to have, I, I hear that VSCA would like to be represented, but also do you want the league on here? Um, might not hurt if we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna add, then I would add the league and the VSCA. I get, my question is one of precedent. Do we normally have the union involved no. in tax and revenue and uh, this, um, these kinds of studies? No. no. I would strike them. Well, they're not I, in. They're not, um, I don't see why you want the league either. That's right. Um, my, it's really right. around a precedent of who is involved in, um, in, 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 a, uh, um, in this nature of discussion and work. I so. think that's a, uh, actually, it's an issue that the Judiciary Committee should should take up as a committee anyways. I mean, well, why do we have to have outsiders tell us what we should do and not do? Well, the, the problem, Bobby, is that we, the Judiciary Committee, doesn't set fees. It doesn't set budgets. It doesn't do all of that. And so if, if you were to want to move this to the general fund, what would you cut to get in, or what tax would you raise or what how would you deal with it to fund these programs because they're um, you know they're hurting if we you know right now we're able to shore them up a little bit here and there with one-time revenue but it's still problems um, and we have to decide something you know I I think it's 
it's no different than we've got a we've got a shortage in the funding of nine one one. We have no. uh, uh, we have um, um, we have got um, so I, I'm just I'm just thinking that I, I'm I'm thinking about the membership as it relates to the nature and the task of this committee and the extent to which um, we uh, expand membership outside um, um, the administering entities. Um, I, that's what I, I, I would draw the request for the state employees um, and also. Um, I, I think I just have a hard time thinking about this precedent or the extent to which uh, we are, if we decide it's appropriate here, what about the funding of 911? What about the funding of X or whatever? It seems yeah. to me that that is, um, that, that is opening up or establishing a precedent that um, um, is very atypical. And I wouldn't necessarily think that we would want. I, I appreciate that and I'm cognizant of that. I mean, the house didn't have time to put this in or whatever happened, I don't know, but when it came to the house, it was just the Center for Crime Victim Services and in talking with others it seemed wise to expand, the, expand it to the others that are also relying on these fees yeah. to, and surcharges. We actually, what brought it home was the testimony that we had from Pat Gable um, nope. and the impact that the loss in these yeah. revenues are having on the court's budget. And uh, let's face it, this gets, once you're getting into revenues, you're getting into budgets, you're getting into administration. This is, uh, I, I, I just uh, think that, um, um, that the membership should be really uh, as we have identified, the minute you start saying, well, we want employee representation, um, that, that could extend to just about every task force that involves state government. Yeah. All right. I realize you've had the request, you've uh, made the request, we've considered it, but I would recommend that we keep- I would draw, um, I would draw the request. Well, you don't have to. Um, well, no, Marley just barked at me and said. Mm. Oh, okay. So um, we need to keep come going. Here. This is, so it I'm really started to the dog out. When I said, come here, not to you, Senator. Oh. <laughs> well, we started out with crime victims because the, in, the loss of revenues and the declining revenues is really having a detrimental impact. Then when the courts came in and said, we're having a real budgetary problem because of the decline in revenues, we de decided that rather than looking at just one area that's impacted by this loss, we should look at it in a comprehensive way. This is what this draft is designed to do, is reflect the decision to take a more comprehensive approach around the impact of this, these declining revenue streams that support programs or support um, uh, the uh, judicial branch of government. So I, which I'll, I'm thinking we should keep going here and if we can close this out. So uh, is, is this the composition that you want of the committee and it's 13 members, six legislative members and then the other seven listed it's here? A, it's a lot of legislators, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, why so many? Uh, well, because you've Didn't got ways and means because you've revenue, judiciary and appropriations. Yeah. That's when I said if Senator Sears was all three, maybe he could get triple the pay. Yeah, well, I'm not on finance. No, you can only get double the pay. You get double pay. Um, Dick, you've had a chance to look at it. Do you think the membership- I'm fine, um, yeah. In terms of the- Yeah. Okay. I didn't change subsection C at all. I'm still having the executive director of, of the uh, Center for Crime Victims call the first meeting and then, then the, the, the committee itself would vote for the chair and, and you to, if you want if that process is okay I don't know do you think we should have um I like the chief justice 
I was going to say, I, I think from a protocol perspective, we should have the chief justice. Or, or the first meeting. Yeah. As in, mm -hmm. It's or, or designate, correct? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the member from the judicial branch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I think from a protocol perspective, that's yeah. what we should Probably, do. Uh, yeah, I, I think so at this point. Yeah. I've been watching The Crown on Netflix, so I think it's more appropriate. Okay, so we'll change that in subsection C. Are you, um, does that talk about Elizabeth the first and her uh, fight uh, with the, with Parliament over um, the prerogative of oh, yeah. the? Uh, Among no, I'm, no it's, I'm beyond that now. I'm up into the seventies. Oh, okay. Once they had Winston Churchill die, yeah, I I lost interest. Oh. oh. Uh, well, I guess I'm not on the same. Or no, channel. breaking up Charles's marriage. Oh, well, let's keep going here. It's Friday afternoon, and let me tell you, anything yeah, we don't I do know. today, we're going to have to do. Oh, I'm yeah. supposed to be with. I'm supposed to be at a meeting. I'm sorry. Let's wrap this up, and then we're going to have to. Okay, end. I'm good with it. Be be scheduled. With that one change. Another note that that's being scheduled. Oh, I'm, you just uh, did. Yeah. Steve Klein just sent another note that it's being rescheduled. How come he just said I was supposed to be? Oh, oh, he just said rescheduled. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Let's keep going then. So powers and duties of the committee. Um, if, if this I changed around a bit because it was all focused on the crime victims services piece. Um, I did leave in sub four um, specifically in regard to those programs. Um, well, I, I think that's obviously we want the focus. We, we certainly want to make it we, that um, the center needs to obviously, uh, um, we need to make it clear that that's one of the areas that needs to be examined. Because that's what started the whole discussion. Anything? Okay. I'll keep going down. Who provides um, E, and then can we keep going? Oh, yep. Sorry. It says um, need to go meet with the speaker, but does that mean I don't need to go? Nobody does anymore because they canceled the meeting. I'm going to reschedule. Oh, okay. All right. Um, November 1st, is that a good date? Or should we give them a little more time? That's, so I, that's the reason I highlighted it, just given, given how, well, do, do you want to push that out into December or even January 15th? Well, assuming that you need legislation, yeah. the Senate can't introduce legislation after December 15th. Oh. That's we, usually, I mean, we could do November 15th or something like that. It's fine. Okay. <clears throat> you'd want, if there's legislation proposed, you'd want to have it ready to go. I don't know what our date is, but, you know, remember that some point like December 12th or somewhere in there, we, we're not allowed to introduce legislation. So the date probably should stay the same then. Well, the latest it could be was November 15th. If we have to introduce by December 15th, you said, Dick, second year? I think it is somewhere in the, you know, usually it's between, I don't know how John Bloomer figures it out. It never did. It's usually somewhere between the 10th and the 15th. Okay. Well, do you want to change it to the 15th? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, we'll just change it to the 15th. All right, and then you know, no more. Jane, and then, do you do you know how long we're going to work, Jane? Well, um, I'm just trying to think. Um, Dick, you probably are not going to. We're going to have to do. Um, we've got the courts. We've got both uh, um, two pieces, one time, and um, um, and any. Uh, adjustments we make to the base. So um, 
Are there any other loose pieces? I'm, I know people are getting tired. It's Friday afternoon, it's 3.30. Um, um, but the more, um, as I said, the more little things that we can get out of the way, are there any other little things um, after this? Uh, but first of all, before we go, are we ready with this language? We changed the date. Yep. Okay, we're gonna put it in. And if somebody's got a problem, we can always, you know, we're making changes when we get into a committee of conference or, you know, something. Um, are there any other pieces, Stephanie, that we could do easily without taxing people? But I'm thinking 3.30, we're gonna meet on Monday starting at nine. Um, the only other thing I can think of, I don't know, Senator Westman, I, the language around the adult Thank days, you. if you wanted to, to go into that one, but. Okay. You may have left us. The moment. Um, he may have. I think he did. Um, that one probably won't take very long on Monday. No. All right. Um, then we'll we'll inventory the language that we still need to close out. We've got a couple of draft um, okay. language that we need on emergency housing um, that has come over, and we're going to. Uh, basically put in the language um, that was proposed to go with a $41 million emergency housing um, uh, plan that so we took a lot to of testimony. The rental part of that, they already have the CRF in hand. Okay. So, um, and that is to, that's the 36 million or the- um, The 36 million is the is, is part of the 41 that, um, right. that they need that appropriation, but they don't need, what brings it up to 41 is the CRF, but that's already been appropriated to them. So they need the 36 million is what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Okay. And then the piece um, that you talked about on reach up. Is any of that for landlords of that money? On the emergency housing, it would be mostly in the hotel arena. So it's it's not there is money for landlords and it's in it's being administered by the Vermont State Housing Authority and it's one hundred and ten million dollars right. that is going out in rental assistance and it can pay up to twelve months. The people have to have uh, incomes under eighty percent of area median income. In addition, there's also assistance for utilities for those households, um, including arrearages on electrical or water sewer. Um, so the, that, that money um, just is starting to go out through the Vermont State Housing Authority. Okay. And uh, uh, there's a website that you could refer people to. And uh, I think landlords can apply, but I think it, they would have to um, uh, have agreement with the tenant because they've got to determine the income eligibility. Nice. But there is money for that. Um, and the other um, part, so I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, say that we should move the requested language to appropriate the 36 million that is necessary to support the um, uh, the uh, emergency rental help that um, plan that we had um, Commissioner Brown go through in exhaustive detail. Yep. Um, in addition, there is a possibility, and I mentioned that under that second. Um, emergency rental, that we could do more money to assist reach up families with um, their rent. And um, so this would be um, a language that would allow them to make use some of these uh, emerge of these rental um, federal dollars uh, to go out if it's possible, because you've got the problem with that 12 month limit, which still hasn't been clarified. So if the second round of the emergency rental uh, doesn't um, can um, be extended beyond the 12 month period that was in the first round of rental assistance. There's, it says up to 15 million would be, a, uh, that could be used to supplement, continue or extend the rental assistance program for reach up as permissible, uh, if permissible, as permissible under the federal uh, rules. So uh, they just want the authority that if that's possible to do and under that second round, um, we would uh, um, allow 15 million of those dollars to go um, out in rental assistance. 
So I'm going to suggest we put those, get that uh, into the budget, um, as much language as we can get in. Um, Rich, do you have uh, the adult day language? You've got one with money and without money. You might as well go to the one without money. You're, you're muted, Rich. Um, Stephanie has it. I will, okay. I will open it up then and, and on just a second. And let me open that document. We're absolutely going to be done by four, Bobby. Stephanie, I have it. Do you want me to share it on the screen? Do you need to yeah, go? You, yes, down? you put it up on the screen. Thanks. What time do yep, you have to go, Bobby? Great. You're muted. He said right now. Oh, okay. I said I I've got a funeral that I should attend. Well, you yeah. should attend it. Um, if we go uh, to quarter four, is that going to be too late for you? You need to leave right now. Um, That'd be I, really good with quarter four, too. Okay. Okay. Um, so I want to get this language, Bobby. Bobby, if you, if you don't leave, go to the funeral, they won't go to yours. <laughs> they won't be going to mine anyway, but they're a family in town that we... Bobby, you should go right now. This language, you know, I think you'll be fine with whatever we yeah. decide. Okay. okay. And Thanks then once we get through this language, we're going to call it a day. Okay. Thank you. And have a, okay. have a short weekend. We'll see you Monday. <gasps> yeah. So the first piece is the language to go um, with... Um, the five million for the adult days. Mm -hmm. And um, this language um, um, came from um, the adult days themselves. And what you see in yellow is um, the edits from Dale itself. So both the um, uh, Dale and um, the adult days um, um, have come up with this language. So. Um, I, I don't see that as anything controversial, but they both would like the language. Okay. I, I think that that clarification is a rewrite is, seems fine. Yep. All right. So now um, I had said, you know, I thought that we, we would let them try, we would send out something instructive um, and uh, about getting the um, uh, adult days back operational in both Rutland and the Barry area. So, um, and so, so one is with money and one is well, come and back and budget adjustment. The first, uh, well, it, can you scroll, can you scroll up? up a little bit? Right. So um, I, here's two choices. I asked Dale to come up with language to talk about giving them some instruction. The first part was the language they did. They left the um, line where the dollar amount was blank, but that was the language they came up with. They said to me it cost, on average, $73,000 a month to run an adult day. The $438,000 represents six months in that. The second language is language that I came up that um, just instruction, They'll work with community partners to seek um, organizations interested in opening adult days. Um, um, and um, shall um, request funding in the 22 budget adjustment process to provide um, restart grants. I like the latter. I think six months at this point with so much work, I think instructing them that they have a role and a responsibility for getting these programs started is really important. I, I would say to you that um, I, um, I think it's been hard for them to get to the place to understand that people think that they have a role. Hmm. They, see well, the adult, they see the adult days as um, private businesses and they see that, um, think that it needs to be somebody coming up in the community to do that. But the problem is in the, in the, section with the 5 million, we're giving existing adult days that are going to reopen um, what it looks like about half of the money that they need to run their business for the next um, um, year. The problem with a new adult day that would open in Barrie, Newberry, or Rutland, or any place else that might open, 
because they have no history, they would not be eligible for any of that money. And um, I, um, the only thing I'd say about the top piece is, and it may not be possible for if anybody could get off the ground before next January, I wouldn't want to hold them back. But um, um, I'm easy either way. We're going to do it. And if you like the second one, let's go with it. Okay. I think that in light of how tenuous it is, there's a lot of groundwork to be done with these communities to even um, get uh, to the point where there's a proposal that is um, fundable. Yeah, I, um, I understand that. But I want to give somebody, if somebody is willing to take this on and do the work, I'd like them to know that um, it isn't just they'll come and ask for money. I I, I want to give somebody confidence that, that because I think these adult days, particularly in those two bigger communities, are vital. Yeah, well, I think you've done that by they shall request the funding and the budget adjustment. So it, it really gives them a time to work with the communities, come up with a proposal and a commitment that the funding uh, will be um, provided um, in, in the budget adjustment. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's um, almost quarter of four, I'm going to suggest we go with the second one and uh, let Senator Sears, um, he needs to call it a day. Yep. Um, and um, if other people say they really want us to keep working until midnight, let me know. I don't, Alice doesn't look like it. Right. Um, so um, I